Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm coming to you with a special program about the unfolding events in Syria. It is the morning of December 9th here in Japan, and we just learned that Bashar al-Assad, the long-term leader of the Syrian state, has arrived with his family in Russia, where he has been granted humanitarian asylum. It is now official. Damascus is completely in the hands of Hayat Arir al-Sham, a.k.a. al-Nusra, the... Uh, Iran has evacuated its embassy and the Russians are, according to their own statements, in talks with the rebels slash terrorists who are now in control of large, large swaths of Syria, even if not of everything. Here with me to discuss what all of this means is Ambassador Chas Freeman. Ambassador Freeman served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense and as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia in the early 1990s, among his many other uh, postings. Ambassador Freeman is really one of the great great U.S. Uh, experts, not only on U.S. policy and foreign policy toward uh, West Asia, but also about uh, the the region itself. Uh, he has been uh, observing it together with, uh, with colleagues for decades. So it is a great uh, honor to have you here, Ambassador Friedman. Very happy to be with you, Pascal. Well, Ambassador Freeman, can you maybe tell us a little bit, like when you heard about this rapid, rapid uh, territorial gains that this, um, I don't know whether to call them rebels like our media does or to call them terrorists, uh, but when you heard about this rapid uh, success, what did you think? Because it took, took them two weeks to go from just a stalemate to basically controlling uh, almost everything that Assad used to control before. Well, I think it's uh, still too early to tell exactly what the full implications of this are, particularly for Syria. Uh, but uh, the implications geopolitically in the region are enormous. Basically, the big winner from this is Israel and the Netanyahu government. Um, they have successfully pounded Hamas into the ground in Gaza, where they have not destroyed it, but it is on life support, as it were. Uh, they have decapitated Hezbollah and decimated its ranks. Um, they are uh, they have um, shown no regard whatsoever for the alleged for the so-called ceasefire uh, that they concluded uh, with the Lebanese government, um, uh, and, um, and now they have uh, removed the logistical support for Hezbollah from Iran uh, because the bridge to Lebanon has been Syria. Um, this is a big loss for Iran. Uh, it um, means that its forward deployed uh, deterrent forces, meaning Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, in particular, uh, the Houthis in Yemen are still active, of course, uh, have been uh, uh, basically eliminated. Uh, and uh, so now it faces the, uh, Israel directly with no capacity in Israel's immediate neighborhood to respond. This in turn raises some really serious long-term questions because if Iran no longer has a conventional deterrent to Israeli attack or, or to counter Israeli efforts at regional hegemony, uh, it is very likely that the voices which have been ever louder in Iran calling for the development of nuclear weapons will now overcome the religious scruples of the regime and achieve that. So this is a very dangerous moment um, in terms of nuclear proliferation, even though I haven't really seen that discussed uh, publicly. Um, it is not clear at this point exactly what the role of various foreign forces was uh, in this stunning uh, conquest of Syria by uh, Hayat uh, Tahrir al-Sham, um, the, um, uh, the leader of which uh, was uh, the Al-Qaeda representative in Syria earlier. Uh, his name, his nom de guerre is, is uh, not his actual name, is uh, Abu Muhammad al-Julani. Al-Julani means he comes from the Golan Heights, which are under Israeli occupation. And yet, apparently, this movement which must have had a lot of support from Israel um, in its conquest of Syria, uh, has promised to establish relations with Israel. Uh, and uh, it will be interesting to see whether that pledge uh, is carried out. 
uh, I, I think uh, the other notable aspect of this, among many, is that the forces that advanced against the Syrian National Army were very well trained, well led. Uh, they had a full panoply of modern weapons, including drones from Ukraine, suggesting that Ukraine saw an opening in Syria to hit back at Russian influence. Uh, since the Russians had been the prime supporters other than the Iranians of the Assad government. Uh, and uh, they had tanks. Uh, this was not a, a guerrilla force so much as an organized conventional army. Uh, and uh, their training and their equipment showed. On the other side, it is pretty clear that the internal divisions of the Assad government um, helped to bring about the rapid collapse of its resistance to this attack. I think it's important to note that the announcement that uh, the regime had fail fallen, that the Assad family had fled the country, came from the chief of the, of the Syrian armed forces. And the background here is that both Turkey and Russia had been pressing Assad for for. Um, numerous recent occasions to make his peace with the jihadis, uh, to bring try to bring some sense of unity uh, to Syria, and he had refused. And it therefore is not implausible uh, that both Turkey and Russia basically wrote him off, um, and uh, that um, um, the uh, Syrian army, Syrian army basically was commanded by uh, its uh, its uh, its officers uh, to lay down its arms and change into civilian clothing and not resist. So a uh, final point is that um, uh, this is uh, a remarkably uh, uh, a development in Syria that is remarkably free of mass bloodshed. Uh, it was relatively blood free uh, because the resistance was so ineffectual or non-existent. And um, this in turn reflects bad judgments by uh, Bashar al-Assad in recent years, as he has, he came into office um, when about 2003, I think, um, um, a promising reform and a different regime than that of his father, Hafez al-Assad. Uh, and um, he didn't deliver. He basically instead became increasingly ruthless in his use of uh, the security forces to prop up his uh, his government. And uh, I think he forgot that the reason he was able to survive was not because the people of Syria loved him or favored him, but that many of them thought that he was better than all of the alternatives. Uh, Mr. Al-Jolani, the head of the now triumphant um, resistance movement to Assad, um, as who's about 42 years old, young, still uh, vigorous, um, has apparently learned some important lessons. Um, he's separated himself to some extent from the uh, violent Islamist past that he represented. Uh, he has been considerate of Christians, among other things, uh, he has been less uh, inclined to slaughter uh, Shia, uh, but he is a Salafi uh, Muslim. Uh, and we will now see whether, since he is basically in charge, although he has said he will defer to the choice of the Syrian people in terms of who governs Syria, uh, and is you know, presenting himself as a liberation movement, which is indeed what Hayat uh, Tahrir means uh, the Organization for Liberation of Syria. Um, it, is, uh, it is not clear at all um, whether he has changed color, whether he has in fact become what Western propaganda, uh, which is gleeful about the fall of Assad, is, uh, is saying about him, namely that he's a democratic liberal uh, jihadi. Uh, this is uh, quite a volte face, uh, but um, it is hardly to be unexpected, given the amazing ability of the Western media uh, to present distorted views of reality when it comes 
to anything that goes on in West Asia. Do you think that, uh, or what do you think about just this point, that now we see again how the West is actually, uh, at least rhetorically, supporting a, an Islamist group, even an, an offspring of Al-Qaeda, uh, the very group that is responsible for attacking the United States back in 2001, and the, that, that so, so much US like military fighting went against, and that, um, that now this is being talked about not only so positively, but as you said, they had modern weaponry. Now, a lot of talk is that they received the, this support from Turkey, but even if so, some of it would have at least at least have to have come some through some NATO channels uh, from the West. Uh, does this make sense to you in, 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 the, in the strategic game in the region? Well, you have to remember that, um, of course, Syria and Lebanon uh, were created as separate countries by France in the colonial era. The French have a strong interest in what happens in Syria. I note that uh, uh, President Macron has uh, expressed great delight at the overthrow of the Assad uh, government. Um, one has to assume that uh, the French were somehow involved in this. Certainly the CIA must have been involved. The first uh, CIA effort at regime change in Syria was in 1947, at the very moment of its inception. Uh, and there were multiple efforts uh, to overthrow governments in Syria uh, and, 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 and well before Hafez al-Assad uh, took power, I think that was in the 1960s, um, and um, uh, multiple efforts to change that regime changed. They all failed. Uh, there were efforts, of course, to change the Bashar al-Assad regime, to overthrow it. Hillary Clinton and others famously advocated that. Uh, the United States the CIA spent about $5 billion uh, in training of various groups, including this one, um, to, uh, to, to, uh, to overthrow the regime, presumably on behalf of Israeli security interests, uh, which have been foremost in the minds of the Biden administration and certainly the incoming Trump administration promises nothing if not more of the same and maybe more, even less nuanced. So, um, as I said, there are many foreign hands in this. Uh, precisely what role was played by whom is a little bit murky still. Uh, but um, finally, uh, the effort to engineer regime change in Syria has been achieved. Let me just make another couple of comments. What we do not know at all is what the future Syria will look like. Um, the objectives of the various parties have been different. Uh, the objective of the United States in the 1950s was to um, prevent uh, the, the communism from taking over, in other words, Soviet influence in Syria. Uh, we have been against the Russian presence in Syria more recently. Um, the Israeli objective has been to fragment Syria into its component ethnic and linguistic parts so that um, it would not pose a threat it would be, a, this would be a classic divide and rule uh, technique. The Turkish uh, uh, emphasis has been, well, first, uh, varied over the years, sometimes good relations with Syria, uh, when Turkey had a policy of no problems with its neighbors, uh, sometimes violent uh, opposition to Assad. The current Turkish interests, which have been at play in this uh, dramatic set of events, uh, include not only the elimination of the Syrian Kurdish uh, factions that are allied with the uh, terrorist PKK in, in Turkey and the removal of them from the Turkish border, but the return to Syria of um, uh, the roughly 5 million Syrian refugees who are in, in Turkey. Uh, and I think Mr. Erdogan tried very hard to make peace with Mr. Assad, mostly in the interest of removing uh, the refugees from Turkish soil. But when Assad balked, um, uh, he unleashed, unleashed uh, this force that his troops had been training. 
But, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, the one thing is clear, as I said at the outset, this is a major uh, victory in, uh, for uh, the Israeli government of Netanyahu in terms of uh, eliminating regional rivals um, and opening a path directly to an attack on Iran, uh, which the Iranians must now devise a new method of deterring. Um, so um, uh, this accords with the Biden administration uh, objectives, which have been very much supportive of Israel, even in its genocide in Gaza, in its uh, no re effective reaction to the pogroms and ethnic cleansing efforts in the West Bank, a support for Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Uh, and I can say if the biggest winner of this has been the Netanyahu government in a military sense, we should also remember that that government has done so many hateful things that it has made Israel the most hated society and country on the planet. And it has also sacrificed international law, every last shred of it, with the cooperation of Western powers. And it has destroyed the reputation of the West in the rest of the world for any kind of principled approach to humanitarian issues. Uh, so um, the costs to Israel in the long run are huge, uh, but the military advantages that it has gained are quite substantial. How is it possible that this was, this happened, like an ultra Islamist group is taking over these parts of Syria that were actually cooperating with uh, with Iran and with Hezbollah in order to oppose the this genocide that's going on in Gaza. I mean, there was an element of pan uh, pan Muslim uh, solidarity, not from all parts, way not, and we see that right now. And there's a, a very particular kind of Islam that op that obviously doesn't actually care, that not only doesn't care, but uses a strategic opportunity in order to fall into the back. And I think this is what shocks the Iranians the most, that it, at this moment, it is like through Turkey, through an Islamist group, that the that the support for Hezbollah and so on is being, is being cut off, which were really, together with Yemen, the only ones who tried militarily to assist the, the, the Palestinians. How do you make sense of this, that it is Islami Islamists who are now trying to find an accord with Israel? It is, uh, well, I, I should have mentioned when I earlier spoke of the CIA assistance to this group that um, I should have mentioned that it's very ironic that there's a $10 million bounty on the head of Mr. Al Jolani uh, from the CIA. Uh, so one assumes that this is now going to be the subject of bargaining with him. Uh, that the United States will uh, will offer to take this bounty off his head um, uh, in return for what? Uh, for a, a removal of the Russian presence, perhaps? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the Russians are now in a, a bargaining, as you mentioned, with uh, the new authorities about their uh, base, and particularly their naval base. Uh, and um, we don't know what what will happen, but that has been important to Russia uh, in its diplomacy in West Asia, its influence, uh, and it is the only warm water port that Russia really possesses. So um, this is important to the Russians. Um, I think um, we don't know uh, whether, as I said, you know, we don't know whether Syria will now be united under this Salafist uh, regime which claims to have a kind of tolerance for that it never previously displayed. Um, the Alawite group, which is the uh, group of uh, a really rather um, uh, heretical Shia Muslims that uh, Bashar al-Assad belongs to, must now be very frightened about what will happen. Uh, the Iranians have always regarded the Bashar al-Assad regime, the Ba'athist regime in Syria as a secular apostate, not really Shia, not really um, associated with Islam. And while it is true that um, Hezbollah, which is now withdrawn from Syria, by the way, um, apparently withdrawn its troops, which had backed the regime uh, of, of Assad, it's true that Hezbollah and others were backing the Palestinians in Gaza, but basically Assad did nothing. And um, 
uh, on this score. And in fact, he tolerated repeated Israeli airstrikes on supply lines going through Syria to uh, to Hezbollah in the Bekaa Valley and elsewhere. So um, I think there are a huge number of questions now. And I note that Israel has done, has reacted opportunistically to the chaos in Syria by seizing the demilitarized zone that the UN was managing between Syrian forces and its own um, in the Golan Heights. So it has taken the opportunity to annex more Arab land, in effect. Um, and I don't know. The UN, you know, is so uh, sidelined uh, that uh, I haven't heard anything from uh, Secretary General Guterres about this. And yet, basically, Israel has once again thumbed its nose at the United Nations and resolutions. The resolution that created that demilitarized zone was a Security Council resolution, supposedly binding on all members. So there are a lot of loose ends here, and it will take some time for them to um, be untied or unraveled or whatever the proper word is. So um, what do you think, I mean, what, what will happen humani on the humanitarian side, whether the Alawites will now see like mass persecution, that's something nobody can can foretell probably because uh, on the one hand you're right the 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 regime that just took, is taking over now is is famous for for um, not respecting human rights on the other hand they are promising that they will do it so who knows whether they are actually no. going over, over and beyond themselves but with iran so iran is now properly isolated aren't they like this is yes, um, they have been they have been uh, cut off from their major um allies, uh, clients, if you will. I mean, there was always, there's always been a great deal of nonsense spoken about Hezbollah and Hamas and so on. These are independent-minded uh, organizations that reflect the views of the populations they represent. In the case of Hezbollah, it is demonstrably independent uh, of Iran. Um, Iran has actually historically been more of a restraining force on Hezbollah than anything else. But of course, now Hezbollah is on its own, basically. Um, and um, so we don't know what will happen there. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Iran uh, now faces a, a Trump administration coming into power in Washington, which is the uh, uh, second coming of the regime that um, overrode the Security Council approved uh, JCPOA or nuclear deal with Iran. Um, uh, Iran might, well, that probably will increase the likelihood of Iran trying a nuclear breakout in the near future. And of course, we're in an interregnum in the United States. We have a, a president who falls asleep at meetings with African leaders in Rwanda. Uh, thus demonstrating that he is quite as senile as many people have thought and incompetent. And we have uh, Donald Trump, who is um, uh, full of uh, ignorant prejudices, I should say, um, uh, rather than deep knowledge about foreign affairs, uh, who just uh, who has just threatened almost the entire world with a tariff war um, and um, uh, whose main interest in West Asia seems to be uh, to have the Israelis wind up the whole thing. Uh, yeah. So, so I don't know what happens now, but if I were Iranian, I would be, I would be rethinking everything that I have been doing. And the irony there, of course, is that Pazeshkian, the new Iranian uh, president, is uh, a moderate who wanted to reach out to the West and was looking for compromise. And he's now been put in a position where compromise is utterly impossible. If you look at um, the people, the the picks for the incoming administration of Donald Trump, um, despite that he promised not to put in there um, the the same people who led him to belligerent belligerent acts in the past uh, it seems to me that 
all that the current that the new administration will probably do. And these people are not confirmed yet, but they, they their names are out. Um, most of the new cabinet are actually just as much hawks or neocons as before, just not neo, just not hawks in, in, in relation to Ukraine. That's actually the, the kind of, the, the, it seems, the consensus seems to be that they want to wind down this this war. But uh, the, the other people that, that are coming in seem to me people who want to either have a war with Iran or a war with China. So it seems you, you exchange one theater for another. Uh, what's your impression? Oh, I don't think that's a, not a wrong analysis at all. Um, uh, the the people who are coming in are belligerent, um, bellicose. Uh, they're proponents of the use of force, except in Ukraine. Uh, I think they have a concept of trying to turn Russia against China, uh, which is uh, something that is, I don't think, going to happen. Um, but um, I don't think they have thought through the end game. In Ukraine, uh, the meeting in Paris just now between President-elect Trump and uh, Mr. Zelensky apparently was accompanied by some fairly tough language about uh, negotiating a ceasefire and so on. But I don't think the Russians want a ceasefire. Uh, I don't think they want a demilitarized zone in Ukraine. I think they want a peace in Europe and uh, they want a peace with Ukraine. And um, my own guess, and I have said this elsewhere, is that we are in for a Korean conflict scenario in which da da tan tan, as the Chinese say, uh, you know, fighting goes on while the negotiations uh, attempt to arrange an armistice or some further. Uh, but I don't think the Russians want an armistice. I don't think they want a DMZ, uh, which would leave Europe in a position of constant tension and potential warfare and not provide for their security in a way that they uh, they demanded uh, two and a half years ago uh, when they well it's almost three now i guess um uh, when they uh, when they launched their uh, when they uh, issued an ultimatum demanding negotiation of a uh, european security architecture that would reassure them as well as the west uh, so um i think we're in for something in Ukraine that uh, probably resembles nothing so much as the Peace of Westphalia, which took, I think, three years and was conducted in multiple f forums. And they're different issues, you know. I mean, they're, the Ukrainians and Russians have to work out a border between them. Nobody else can do that for them. We can offer advice. We can complicate the process. But in the end, the, Moscow and Kiev need to work that out. Um, the question of minority rights in Ukraine, which does, touches on the OECD rules and guarantees of linguistic and cultural autonomy for minorities, um, along the lines of the Austrian State Treaty, if you wish, um, needs to be addressed in a broader context. I think the OECD, the EU, Major countries in Europe have an interest in that. Certainly the Russians have an interest. The Hungarians, the Romanians, who have minorities in Ukraine who've been oppressed, have an interest in that. So that's yet another forum. And then there's finally the issue of uh, the United States, Russia, NATO, major European powers, uh, uh, sitting down to try to work out some broader framework for peace in Europe. All of this is extremely difficult. And we have now, just this morning, uh, it's Sunday uh, here in the United States still, uh, just this morning we had uh, Donald Trump reiterate his willingness to withdraw from NATO. Um, you know, if if, if uh, he doesn't think the balance of payments connected with NATO is uh, sufficiently generous. Uh, I think he has a point. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we are, what, 75 years Oh, almost 80 years after the end of World War II, uh, coming up on 80 years after the end of World War II. And why is it that Europeans are incapable of defending themselves? Um, why is it that Europeans defer to a power across the Atlantic uh, for every important decision? Well, of course, it's easy to do that. But I can understand the, uh, the reason that the right wing in the United States has, says, why should we be carrying this burden? Um, well, of course, from the European point of view, 
we've not just been carrying the burden, but we've been getting Europe into trouble uh, by the leadership that we have displayed. Anyway, I think there we are at a moment in which multiple things in West Asia, the Middle East, if you will, uh, in the Eura in Eurasia, in Europe, are all in flux. And it will be very interesting, uh, that's too mild a word, to see how this all plays out. A final note, uh, Pascal, if I may, uh, my sense is that the Chinese have cleared the decks for an operation against Taiwan. Uh, I don't think they've made a decision to do that, but I know that they've made peace with India in a sense, when they've removed the danger of a diversionary attack on their on their uh, southwestern border uh, in, with, in Tibet. Uh, they have consolidated their relationship with Russia. Uh, they have increased the, the cooperation with Russia on both technology and military operations, as well as intelligence. And they have just basically answered American economic warfare with their own economic warfare. Uh, they had previously not responded to sanctions in kind. Uh, now they are. Um, and uh, so it looks to me uh, as though uh, they're ready uh, politically, if not yet militarily, uh, to take on this issue of bringing the Chinese civil war to an end and reuniting China. Um, now, um, uh, I know that uh, there is now a lot of talk by the Chinese also, and this is important, uh, that Pacific Asia, which is the term I prefer, uh, because I think uh, Indo-Pacific is a fraud as a concept. Um, Pacific Asia is uh, is um, very much a Chinese sphere of economic influence anyway. Uh, and uh, every country in the region, with the possible exception of Japan, um, although I think Japan is divided, you would know more about that than I, uh, every country in the region is looking for an accommodation with China, would like American backing for that, but don't want to make a choice between China and the United States. Uh, Japan may be an exception in that regard. Um, and uh, so this is a very fluid moment, uh, both in Europe and in Pacific Asia and now in West Asia. And I won't talk about Latin America, but I could make the case there too that that outpost of Western civilization is uh, also in a state of flux. You took my last question. Uh, you already answered it because I was I wanted to ask what you think China is going to make out of this. But maybe just as a last point, because China had a, um, a West Asian strategy, and that was basically trying to stabilize things, right, by brokering an accord between Iran and Saudi Arabia. That was a big deal. Um, do you think the current events are like, now going against the that strategy of China, basically trying to 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 have a terrain for its trade relationships, uh, is so is this also a setback for China, or what what do you think Beijing makes out of this? I don't think it's a setback for China because the Chinese relationship with Syria, although it was uh, proper, was never very cordial or intensive. And there are a lot of people who have looked to China to rebuild Syria, uh, perhaps Chinese commercial interests will come into play and, and that will happen. Uh, but the main interest that the Chinese have strategically at this point is the distraction of the United States by events in West Asia. And the United States is now thoroughly distracted. We keep trying to pivot away from West Asia toward Pacific Asia and events in West Asia, mostly uh, the product of uh, our uh, Israeli friends, um, continuously uh, frustrate our desire to redeploy. Uh, so uh, you you mentioned, um, you know, maybe the incoming administration, although it is determined, uh, it says, uh, to reduce uh, involvement with Ukraine. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, actually. But um, whether if it is indeed so determined, um, uh, then it is not going to be, a, it is not determined to get out of the Middle East. Uh, and um, we remain, I remember uh, in one of the first encounters with uh, 
Zhou and I, when we opened our relationship with China, uh, which I remember vividly being an old man, um, uh, he talked about the Soviet Union as overextended. And he said it was like a man trying to kill 10 fleas simultaneously with 10 fingers. And I think that pretty much describes the situation of the United States as we um, fail to deal, fail to adjust to the reduction in our power and influence uh, and, and basically implode in terms of our international relationships. Tariffs, protectionism is a, it is two things. First, it is a recognition that you are not competitive and you require a tariff barrier uh, to restore competitiveness or, uh, or to protect you from it. And second, it is a means of isolating yourself from the world. It reduces interaction with the, the rest of the world. It is not a positive uh, means of competing at all. Uh, and yet this is the course that we're embarked upon, clearly. Uh, there's no reason to doubt, Mr. Trump, that when he says that he equates trade imbalance and imbalances with subsidies to foreign societies. You know, he said, we are subsidizing Canada. Well, because we have a trade imbalance. Um, this is a very peculiar way to look at things. Um, but anyway, he has strong opinions, which most economists find absurd, but um, which he, he doesn't change. So I think very clearly we're headed toward a period of greater um, conflict in our relationships with Europe uh, because the tariff barriers that we put up will greatly affect Europe. I think the Chinese see an opportunity with Europe and they have not given up on trying to enlist Europe in a uh, non-American global framework. Um, and um, uh, again, this is very interesting. Um, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't think anybody does at this point. But everything is in motion everywhere. Mm. And, and I've not seen anything like this in my lifetime. Dangerous times with a... Let's 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 hope we get out of it, um, uh, Ambassador Freeman. I want to let you get out of this interview so you can have another uh, drink and en and enjoy the, the Sunday night. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, well, thank you for having me on, pa Pascal. Keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs>